grew up in Dublin, so I kind of feel somewhat at home there still. Um, so my role now is we, we have 600 people working for PM Group in Dublin. And so my, my role is to talk to, to um, client companies, uh, mainly in the pharmaceutical, medical technology and um, mission critical, which is data centers. Those are our main uh, sectors. And I talk to people in all those uh, sectors um, on a regular basis with a view to basically uh, filling, filling our filling our office with work. So it's, it's a sales position. So that's some, somewhat unusual for me as an engineer and not something I thought I would be doing. But I am doing it because I wanted to do something different, having worked um, in the pharma, pharmaceutical sector in Ireland for many years. Um, so that was a definitive uh, kind of career choice to, to do something different, again, to what I had done for many years. And a brief career history. So I did chemical engineering um, and graduated in 1990, which to me doesn't sound like a long time ago, but <laughs> I'm sure to people on the call, that's like, sounds like prehistoric uh, times. So um, there we are, but time does go fast. And so anyway, I did chemical engineering. My, my two older brothers did mechanical, so I was very radical and I chose to do chemical, having initially resisted uh, doing engineering at all. But anyway, it turned out it was a good choice. And um, I worked for a couple of years in the UK after I graduated, but I wanted to live in Ireland and I came back in 1992. And it was a good choice because the pharma pharmaceutical industry, which I joined working for Smithline Beecham, was just, uh, just starting to, to really grow. It was here. But you know the huge employer that it is now, and the huge contributor to the Irish economy that it is now, you know, came came from that. So I, you know, I timed it well. Starting in 1992, that industry has grown and grown and grown, and has certainly been a huge uh, contributor to the Irish economy. And certainly has, you know, I've I've benefited from that. I've uh, enjoyed a very positive overall career. So yeah, a variety of companies worked for Smithline Beecham, which ultimately became Glaxo Smithline. Um, I also worked for a company called Genzyme, which is an American biotechnology company that um, established a presence in Waterford in 2001. And I joined that as a startup as the second employee, myself and the site head joined together on the first day, wondering why we left steady jobs to go down there, but it all worked out great. And I'm very proud to say if there's anybody from Waterford on the line listening that um, there's about 750 people working there now and something of, of the order of 500 million plus has been invested on that site. So it's extremely, extremely positive to the Southeast region. So after that, um, I then worked for GlaxoSmithKline again. I, I worked for them in the 90s and worked for them again from, from 2007 onwards um, on the site in Cork as engineering director. And then ultimately I went on to do a regional role with them. And I think you, you maybe have seen my brief career history. Um, I uh, worked for, the, for, for a number of factories across uh, Ireland, UK, Scotland, Algeria, Egypt, Saudi, Pakistan, Singapore, and Australia. So I got to visit all those places, which was fantastic. Really enjoyed all that. And then I'll go back to where I started my few, few words here. Uh, I joined PM Group as an Irish-owned uh, company. That was very attractive to me at this point in my career. 30 years in, good Lord. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, doing something different and maybe we'll come back to that in discussion and just just one other thing maybe I didn't mention in in the couple of minutes I've been talking um having done a, a very technical degree in chemical engineering I did feel that um there was a part of my education missing and and so I did an MBA part-time which is not a not for the faint-hearted but I did an MBA um in the in the late 90s as well to a master's of business administration to, to kind of fill that other half of the um qualifications I felt and uh, to learn about business and that has certainly been beneficial to me so I'll probably I'll stop um, stop at that point and uh, hand over to Laurel give a probably more concise yeah. <laughs> than my thank ramblings. Thank you so much Leonard that's fantastic experience um, and fantastic to great get that opportunity to travel mm. as well and um, interesting then that you continued your education um, and decided on that MBA piece which mm -hmm. was, I'm sure, uh, uh, a busy time for you at, at that stage. Yeah, um, it's, it certainly was. It certainly was studying at night and... Um... Yes. No, perfect. That's super. So what I'll do is I'll... Th thanks very much, Leonard. Um, you might hear my um, my gold retriever at the, at the door. So that's, uh, it's a virtual, the virtual world we're living in at the moment. Um, well, you, you can see the real world I'm living in there. <laughs> so I, we all are. We all are. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. Yep, thanks right. very much, Leonard. 
Um, and Laura, over to you. Thanks very much, Leona, and very nice to hear your background, Leonard. Um, so hello, everybody. I'm Laura Dillon. Um, I'm from Sutton in Dublin. And uh, I suppose similar to, to Leonard, I originally studied chemical engineering in, in UCD. Um, I graduated a few years, a few years later, but not too many. So I graduated in 2001. So I've now been working for 20 years and similar to Leonard, it's scary to think about that because uh, it's amazing how the time, time and years have flown by. Um, my current role is working for a private equity firm. So I have done a lot of different things over the past 20 years, but I now work in partnering and investing in Irish companies. Um, and they could be engineering companies, but they literally range from at the moment we're an investor and a partner in a nursing home business here, right through to in the in the Nordics, we're investors in an equestrian business, through to we, we're an investor in a very large private label pet food manufacturer. So it's very, very diverse companies that we um, uh, work with management teams to help them grow their companies and family run businesses uh, to help them really scale their companies. A lot of that scale comes through international expansion where we provide additional capital and, and strategy to, to help those, those businesses. And uh, we're, we're hoping that we'll, we're going to be able to support many Irish companies as well. Um, how did I get here from chemical engineering? Um, I, I did an internship for Pfizer Pharmaceuticals back in 2000 down in Ringeskiddy. We were building OSP4, the fourth plant down there. And uh, after, after that summer, I, I began to evaluate whether, whether I wanted to uh, follow that path. At the time, I didn't really know what other options were open to me. So, so, so similar to what a lot of you guys will be doing, I began to uh, go to all the different career talks that, that came through UCD. And I decided that I'd like to work in business. So I, I moved to London in 2001 and I started working for a strategy consultancy firm called McKinsey. Um, my, my poor mother and father had both worked for um, manufacturing or, or, or sales companies. So they were uh, didn't really understand what the consultancy companies did. And, and, and when I tell them that I was working with big companies and getting to attend their board meetings, my poor father was just confused why anyone would let me do that, you know. But I think what I really found was a background in engineering taught me how to solve logical problems. It taught you a great thought process, which those uh, kind of banks, consultancy firms really, really wanted their graduate to have. Did that for a couple of years. <clears throat> I then uh, decided to move to Edinburgh and I worked in internet banking for a few years. And similar to Leonard, I then decided to go do an MBA. So I moved to Boston for two years. I actually did it full time. So from 2005 to 2007, I did my MBA at Harvard. Um, I was actually meant to go back and work at McKinsey when I graduated because they'd been very supportive and had funded me through my MBA. But uh, during my summer, I had equally done uh, some internships in private equity. I had come back and I'd worked for a firm in London called Cabot Square Capital. And I'd also come back and worked for Jim Barry, who was running NTR at the time and doing a lot of renewable energy investing. So I quite liked being on the investing side of the table. So when I graduated in 2007, I moved back to London and joined Apex Partners who is another private equity firm. Um, we were investing in very large companies and investing through the last recession. So that was quite tough times. And um, after a couple of years, I suppose similar to Leonard from being in London, I decided I wanted to move back to Ireland. So I moved home in 2010 and I decided to uh, get my retired father out of retirement. He was 70 at the time, but we set up a healthcare distribution company. Um, he had experience in that sector. So I had the pleasure of founding and, and running a family family owned company where we were supplying um, cosmetic products into nearly every pharmacy in the country. And luckily, we were one of the first suppliers supplying um, fake tan. Ireland is the highest per capita user of fake tan. And we were supplying a lot of fake tan into pennies and, uh, and other department stores. So I ran that company. Um, and after a couple of years, we decided to uh, sell it into United Drug, who was our who was our largest competitor. At which point I then went back to London. I was in London for five years, again, doing private equity, decided to get back in uh, to, to the finance side. And uh, luckily, early last year, Waterland decided to open an Irish office here to, to partner with Irish companies. And they offered me the role to move home and, and set up a small Irish investment team. So I've now recruited three people to, to work with me. Uh, and the other senior person in the team is, is also an engineer, uh, not from UCD, actually, from DCU, um, but, but, but again, had, had, has had a lot of both engineering but also business experience. Laura, thank you so much. Fantastic experience and very interesting as well. Um, I think it's also interesting the fact that you mentioned those skills that you, you developed as an engineering graduate 
um, held you and I suppose helped you within your career as well. And we, we hear that very often within uh, from engineering companies. It's those skills um, and they're transferable skills that can be brought to, uh, I suppose, any other area and not necessarily even specifically um, engineering. Um, a question had come through in advance and one of them is, um, a good question, which I think is, what do you think has helped your career so far? Um, so, Leonard, can, can I put that question to you first? Um, what do yeah. you think perhaps maybe has helped your career so far? And even if you want to link it in to um, have you made any mistakes and, and how have you learned from them? It's, yeah, it's made, a loaded question. Yeah, no, no, made loads of mistakes. Um, <clears throat> so that and, that and that first, the reason I'm saying that is that mistakes are part of learning, you know? When we all learn to walk as babies, what do we do? We get up, we fall down, we get up, fall down, get up, fall down, you know? So making mistakes is part of it. Hopefully hopefully, you don't kill anybody. Um, and, and I did come close, I have to say, right? One, one thing, one time on, on, a, on a project where there was there was a near miss. So um, what have I learned? K keep an open mind. And um, I guess back when I started working, there wasn't the same level of, there was certainly nothing like we're doing now this session, you know, there was nothing uh, as structured even on career development post-graduation and in the workplace. So I was fortunate that it was just my personality that continued to push to do uh, different things. Now I've stayed within, you know, the manufacturing and pharma sector. So, you know, an, a narrower sector than what you've done, Laura. But, um, you know, I had the, the benefit of doing a number of different roles, working in, you know, manufacturing directly, you know, on, 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 the, on the plant, on the factory, uh, working in technical, transferring in new products, working on capital investments, new projects. And, you know, that's what uh, set me up then to, to progress in my career, actually. So that, that, that would be my strong advice to people, certainly, you know, until you're about 30, try and do as much uh, and beyond wraps, but, you know, try and do as much different things as you can because you're still, you know, you're still learning. We're all still learning. Right? I'm 52, right? I think I'm 25, but I'm actually 52. I'm still learning. That's why I, that's why I, um, I, I went for this role, which is a sales role, because I wanted to do something different. So that's, that's the message really, um, you know, keep, keep doing different things. And, and it's okay to stay at one thing if that's what suits you. But if you want to progress and you want to move up the ranks and stuff, you know, you've got to, you've got to get experience in different things. So that would be that. That would be the advice, and then, and then you know where I started there. You know, making mistakes is is just is part of it. You know, and, and um, that making the mistake isn't the problem. It's 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 how you deal with the mistake, or how you then move on from that. You know, it's how you respond to it. You know, I, I can tell you that dealing with countless you know suppliers and uh, particularly equipment suppliers, you know, things things go wrong, and I've said that countless times to suppliers. Look, we understand shit happens you know things go wrong it's what you do when they go wrong that'll define you so absolutely hey, Leonard yeah I hope that's but helpful think, yeah absolutely thank you very much for your honest answer as well yeah. I think mm. uh, in relation to we all make mistakes and it's the learning from it and to be kind of hand up I, I this is what I did and just fix it if, if you can if you can't ask questions, ask somebody else to help you as well. And also, yep. as you mentioned, I suppose to be open-minded, I think is very good as well. It's great advice, Leonard. Um, yeah, and, yeah. and Laura, same question to you. Yeah, I think uh, I, I would very much echo a lot of Leonard's comments. I have I have made many, many mistakes and I continue to make lots of mistakes, you know. Um, but I, but I think I think for me, the, the key advice is, you know, don't be afraid to try new things. And also, you know, the world is really your oyster. Um, similar to Leonard, I thought when I was graduating from engineering that I, you know, should really work as an engineer. And it was only when I began to go to talks like like this or or, or speak to different people that I I, I really my, my eyes were opened. And it was actually only when I actually started my job at McKinsey in London. I remember saying to the interviewers, you probably think this is unusual that I'm an engineer and I'm applying for a business role. And they said not at all. And when when I started at McKinsey as a, as a business consultant. There were 32 on our graduate program. Three of us were Irish. The other 29 were from the UK. But over 50% of us were all engineers. So, so it was actually a very, very common career path that I hadn't really even appreciated was something that I should consider. And the main reason why they liked to recruit engineers and still do is very much around that um, problem solving ability. Uh, the logical thought processes, they they actually sent all of us, no matter if people had studied business or not, to Oxford for six weeks to do an intensive business training program because they said, we will teach you the business skills, but we want people who are very analytically strong, who can solve problems, who can think logically. 
Um, and and I think I've really followed that 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 kind of uh, I suppose thought process throughout my career. I've kind of said, Do you know what? Uh, why don't I try something else? Why don't I try and start my own company? Um, why don't I go into finance? You know, and 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 it's not always the easiest thing, but I figure, you know, if if, if as long as we're continuously learning, that's the that's the most important thing. You know, we'll all work until we're quite you know quite old. So we need to make sure that we really enjoy what we do, and when we're really enjoying it, we're going to be at our best self. And then and then making sure that we're continuously learning, because if we're not learning, then we're kind of moving backwards, I suppose. Um, so 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 I would say, you know, and if I, my father in initial days said, will you please not just get a steady pensionable job and stop moving jobs? You know, whereas I think now now I think thinking has evolved quite a lot and diversity, um, people having done different roles, I suppose, is now perceived to probably be a positive, whereas historically it may have actually been, oh, why do you keep moving companies or moving jobs? Um, whereas I think thinking has changed that it's good to experience, you know, as Leonard does the sales role, as well as understanding the manual manufacturing and the engineering um, that you kind of get to see it from all different sides of the table. Indeed, in my current role, I am a much, much better investor now than I was in my earlier career before I'd had my own company. Suddenly, I appreciate the challenges of, of running a small company. And, and, and whilst, you know, the companies that we're now looking to partner with and invest in, that really means that I could, I, I could, I could understand, you know, the challenges that the business owners are going through to a greater extent. And if I hadn't have founded my own company, I wouldn't have that experience. So I think it's about that continuously learning, taking opportunities, trying new things, but equally knowing when 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 things are not right for you. I have I have taken jobs. I one one job I didn't even actually mention for one year. I spent a job at a fintech company um, back in 2015 when I moved back to London. And after a while, I decided it wasn't the right thing for me. But it was about saying, okay, what what's the right time to exit? How do I do that? Make sure that it's um you know I've I, I I'm leaving the company on very good terms. Um, but equally acknowledging this probably was a mistake and it's probably, you know, not the right long term opportunity for me. And as Leonard says, it's about how you deal with those with those mistakes, because we all make them and, and, and we all learn from them. And arguably, we learn a lot more from 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 our mistakes and when we fail than, than when we succeed. Right. That's so true, Laura. Thanks, true. thanks again for your honest answer there as well. Um, and I think the importance of gaining uh, work experience or perhaps maybe an internship as well for students. Um, and I think the learning, it does not necessarily have to be a positive experience. Mm -hmm. um, if they have perhaps maybe, if they've realized that it's not actually a good fit for me, it doesn't really align with my personal work values or my skills, that's good learning in itself. So I think you're dead right about getting as much experience as possible again and learn what, what's a good fit for you. Personally. I think you're. I, I think you're dead right, Leona. Mm. My most valuable work experience was probably working for Pfizer and and deciding that I probably didn't want to do that forever. Mm. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, a, a good question came in here. So, do the speakers feel that it's better to go on and try and get an MBA, or can a lot of that learning um, be got through ex experience? I'm sure that's work experience. Um, if you're looking at going into business and entrepreneurship, so um, maybe Leonard. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, if you're considering doing some kind of a postgraduate qualification in business, first thing I'd do is get some get some experience in the workplace. You know, I wouldn't go straight after your engineering degree, straight into a business course, um, you know, and that you'll then bring the real world experience, which will in, will have made you a better person and, and you'll understand the whole context better. So in my own case, I, went, I started the MBA in, I think, in 1996. So that was maybe six years after I came out of college. So that, that's what I would advise there. And you can get a lot of experience in, in your work, absolutely. But for me, in the type of job I was doing, I wasn't getting business experience. So that's why I went and did it. Perfect. Laura? Yeah, um, I, I would agree that definitely getting the work experience before you do any form of postgraduate degree, I think, is really helpful. Um, I, I, I know that I really enjoyed doing an MBA. But what it enabled me to do was actually change career paths from consulting in, into the, the more private equity finance side of things. Um, I, 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 I still actually interview for Harvard and, and the advice that I kind of give to people is, it depends on what your motivations are really for wanting to do it. 
Um, if you know exactly the career paths that you want to do, um, I think you can probably learn more on the job um, in that role over a two year period. Uh, obviously, Leonard did a did, did a did a part time MBA, but it's it's a large opportunity cost, both in terms of time and in terms of money, no matter be it part time or full time. So I think, you know, my one was a two year full time one. It's a big commitment and you need to kind of think strongly before you do that. Um, if I had my time again, I would certainly do it again. Um, but 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 I think I, I, I suppose knew that it would probably take me longer in my career to get to where I wanted to go. Some people want to fast track their career as soon as possible. If that's the case, then maybe an MBA isn't isn't necessarily the right thing to do. So I think I'd be very clear about why I want to do it. Um, if it's just for a brand name, I definitely wouldn't do it. Um, there are lots of ways these days to learn tangible skills. There's a lot, lot of online um, courses. You know, UCD will do online courses. Uh, Harvard, nearly all of the the the, um, the large institutions will, will do large online courses that you can do and test whether you enjoy them or not. Um, but I think certainly I felt that I benefited a huge amount more from my MBA by actually doing two jobs before I went 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 back to study because I'd kind of seen the consulting side. I'd also seen the kind of internet banking side of things. And it meant that I had learned a lot more. Some of my classmates had uh, maybe only done one role and I think potentially had a slightly narrower experience set. And I, I think they may, maybe got a little bit less out of the experience. So I th certainly think having those knocks, having the real world business experience uh, is very, very valuable because then you get more out of the experience as well. Thanks very much, Laura. Absolutely. I think having those, you know, three, four, five plus years before undertaking an MBA, but the importance of understanding why do you actually wish to undertake the MBA and spending some time self-reflecting and wondering why am I applying for this? Thanks very much, Laura. Um, so as I mentioned, there were a number of questions that came in. Actually, another question came through here. Um, did either Laura, Laura or Leonard um, do the UCD master's program in engineering? And if so, which did they do? No, I, I, I didn't. I did my MBA um, through Harriet Watt in Edinburgh. And the reason for that was I could do it by distance learning because I just couldn't afford to not be working and earning a earning earning a living, basically. So that was very attractive to me at that. Now that was, yeah, the mid 90s. So that was it actually online didn't exist. It kind of sounds mad when you think of it. it literally didn't exist. I know you're all laughing. Oh, God, fossil. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I know how the internet works now. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, for, for me anyway, because I didn't want to be a uh, very technical engineer to follow a technical career path, I wanted to be more of a general manager. Um, it didn't make sense to do a master's and go deeper into the technical. It, it made more sense to go in a different direction to fill out that other part of my experience or my qualifications rather uh, in business. Thank yeah, you. and and sim similar for me. Um, I did not do a master's in engineering. I chose to kind of work 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 in business and and then go back and do the masters in in in, in business afterwards. Um, I think at that point I'd probably decided that I really enjoyed my engineering undergrad degree, but but going down an even more technical route probably was not where I wanted to focus, and I wanted to focus slightly more on the kind of business applications. Thanks. Thank you both. And, um, and, and, and Leonard, I have one story. When you talk about the internet, you know, uh, back in my day, you had to queue up during Freshers Week to get your NetSock account in order to have an email account because there was, I think, only a thousand for the entire university or so. So, uh, so it certainly wasn't commonplace when I, when I, when I was at, at UCD either. Yeah. yeah. They're thinking we're just old fogies now, Lord. This is just horrendous. Let's change the subject quick. <laughs> no one has logged that off, so don't worry. No. Okay, everyone yeah. is still what does with that us. Mean? Yeah. <laughs> so thanks very much, guys. Yeah. Um, so as I said, a few questions came in um, earlier um, to us, and one question I think that again that jumped out is: is is there one piece of advice that you um, would give for an engineer starting their career now, um, Leonard? Yeah, um, try, try and get a variety of experiences. I think I touched on that in, in, when I was speaking a few minutes ago that, you know, we're all still learning, but particularly in your 20s, you know, once you once you kind of get through the academic college system and get into the workplace, try a load of different things. You don't know what what's going to really float your boat until you try. Um, so, and, and I have spoken to many people over the years, who, you know, who, have, who, who I've helped advise on their careers and, and quite often people say, yeah, I stayed in that role for too long. I should have really done something different. And that's hard. It's human nature. Once you get accustomed to the environment you're in and you kind of get, get to know the job, 
you know, other things like your life come along and, 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 you know, so having your work kind of well under control can be attractive. But if you're thinking about purely developing your career, you need to push yourself and you need to step out in, and do different things. And it's uncomfortable, but you have to, if, if, if that's what you want, you know, if you want to develop your career, you have to force yourself to do it. Thanks, Leonard. Laura? Yeah, I would, I would say similar to Leonard. I mean, just think broadly. Um, I was certainly unaware of the great possibilities that, that were presented to engineering graduates when I was graduating. I think people are a lot more familiar with them now. But, you know, I think engineering is, 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 is an excellent degree to do. Um, very, very broadly applicable. Uh, people see it as really a very strong fundamental degree that leaves you very broad in order to be able to branch out into other areas. Should you wish to stay in engineering or should you wish to go into other areas? As we say, it's, you know, very strong analytically very strong in logic, very so strong in problem solving. And they're all fundamentals that a lot of industries will look for. So I would just say, you know, d d d d don't think that you don't, that you're not qualified to do something. You know, you'll only know if you, if, if you go do the interview, if you go ask people about it. Most people are very comfortable talking about their roles, their careers, giving advice to people. It's important to find mentors. It's important to find people who've done those jobs. You know, I, I know when I was trying to understand what consulting and banking were, um, I I literally went to some of the panels and I rang one of the banks. I said, listen, I'm going down to the student yachting worlds in France. I'll be in London for an afternoon. Could I come and have a look around your trading floor? I'd like to understand what the traders do. And they kind of said to me, that's unusual, Laura. You haven't applied for a job yet. And I said, I know, yeah, I'd like to come and have a look around to see if I'd like to apply for a job. And they said, that's interesting. We'll let you. OK, right. Do you know, so I think you'll only know if you ask. So I would say think broadly, ask lots of questions and through that kind of exploration and, 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 and trying to understand what different different roles entail will help you to understand what you do want to do and what you don't want to do. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. I, and, I and can I make a point there just to, just to just to add to that? But so engineers are very often introverts and I put myself in that bracket. Right. So it doesn't come naturally to us to do what you did there, Laura. You're clearly mm. more of an extrovert. But, to, you know, to put yourself out there, you know, people aren't going to come up to your door, knocking, knocking their door down, saying we really, Len, we really desperately want you to come and work for us because. Are, we, are any of us that special? We're not. You've got to, got to pinch yourself and get out there. And uh, you're, you're clearly not shy, Laura, but it, it, that's, that, that will stand to you, you know. Thanks very much, guys. Um, I, I suppose on that, um, it, um, Tianu has actually a good question here. It kind of links over a little bit. What do you think about the first job in the beginning for your career? Is there any suggestions for students who are going to graduate and to their first job and perhaps maybe link that in also in relation to an applications because today is very much on effective applications cvs and cover letters um maybe some advice on that first role and also what would you advise to include on the cv and the cover letter uh, that you like to see if you're reviewing cvs and cover letters um leonard Oh, me. OK. Yes. Yeah, so in, in job applications and CVs, now my own personal style would be, um, you know, less is more. If, if a company is asking you in, in an application to provide a brief CV, then provide a brief CV. You know, if they ask for a brief CV, <clears throat> it's because whoever's going to be reviewing them will have a stack of 100 to go through. So 10 pages when they've asked for three pages is, in fact, a negative, you know, so just, you know, be, be aware of that, you know. Um, so that, that would be in terms of the application. Um, try try and put in things that make you stand out, you know, because clearly, Laura, you you rightly there got um, got recognition for you know knocking on the door of a bank and saying, "Can I have a look around?" Because I'm thinking of coming to work here. You you are interviewing them as well as they are interviewing you. You know, you you have to satisfy yourself that that's a place you want to work. So to all of you listening. Um, you know, it was different in my time, you know, we were just desperate and we're well, not quite desperate, but just delighted to get a job. Right. So I can, I can certainly remember that, you know, the times were different. There wasn't the same level of choice. So we were just delighted to get the job. So but but, you know, you are you are interviewing them in terms of do you like the culture and do you like the way the, the, the people who you're interfacing with? Do, do you like the way they behave? Do you think you could uh, do you think you could fit in there? Do you think you could work there? And uh, in terms of the choice of first job, um, it's very similar to what we've said uh, earlier. Try and get you get yourself something that will give you the chance to to to, diver, to diversify what you're doing to do more than just one thing. You know, so if they if they say they're hiring to get someone to do you know exactly this one role, then maybe just challenge that. Uh, and 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 in the early stage of your career, it is all about getting different experiences. 
Excellent. But putting yourself out there, even for that first mm -hmm. graduate role to ask for yeah. eight different experiences, a different department. Yeah. Thanks very much. Laura. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, I I think something that luckily I did get, but that I hadn't fully appreciated was going to a, a an organization that really invests a lot in their graduates is very, very important, in my opinion. So, um, you know, if I think about some of the engineering firms, you know, I'm sure PM is in this category, you know, they give great graduate experience where they do rotate you around different departments, I suppose. And I think from a graduate perspective, that means that they are investing a lot in you and that you learn a lot about the different areas of the business. And it's that continuous learning, helping you to see, well, actually, do I want to do the process control? Do I want to do something that's slightly more different, you know? And I think I think it really helps to, to help you understand understand all the different areas. So I would be a big fan of finding companies that, that have strong graduate programs. Um, I, I had underestimated that, I suppose. By default, luckily, McKinsey did invest a huge amount in their graduate programs, as do a lot of the, you know, banking firms, as do the accountancy firms, you know, as do a bunch of the larger engineering firms. Um, and I, I would be, a, I would be, you know, a strong advocate of early in your career, going to a large firm that can really afford to invest in their graduate program a lot, because you will learn a lot from that. They'll put you on training programs. They'll help you even like with presentations skills they'll help you with some of those business skills they'll help you you know with other areas outside of your core role because they know that's important if you're going to be moving up the organization for the longer term and um, so I would probably be keener to start with a larger larger firm that can invest in people and then later in my career if I want to go to a slightly more entrepreneurial or smaller firm I think that's great but unfortunately a lot of the time smaller firms whilst you'll get a broad experience they typically don't have the same level of structured graduate program and they can't normally afford to invest both the time or the resources in training graduates to the extent that some of the larger firms can. Um, so I, I, I would definitely uh, think about who has strong graduate programs, you know, and the information these days that you can find on, on various different websites and that sort of stuff on which are good graduate programs is really valuable. Um, then if I think about the, the kind of CVs and applications, um, I would say, you know, keep, keep it relatively short, a one or two page CV and focus on kind of all the, all the core skills that you have. They're really looking for attributes. What do you have? What do you have in terms of leadership? What do you have in terms of teamwork? How have you done in your academics? But what else are you going to bring to the table? You know, from my perspective, I did a lot of sailing every year through university. So Pfizer was actually my only work experience, apart from doing quite competitive sporting activities. So I'd include those sporting activities showing how, how, do, you, how do you play as part of a uh, a, a team, you know, what leadership activities do you have? Where you, you know, I don't know, section treasurer or where you, you know, in, involved in the engineering um, society. Um, putting all those things down are, are good talking points and show that you have kind of drive and, and leadership. Um, and I would, I, I would also really think about, you know, trying to do one or two good internships, I think is very valuable. Um, and even if it's only for a couple of weeks or so, it at least shows that you have the, uh, the, 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 the drive to go out and, and really understand different roles and different markets. So, so I would say a short, a short, you know, application letter with maybe two or three paragraphs and then a one or two page CV um, and hitting the succinct points. I think you're right, uh, Laura. Thanks very much for that. It's it's what we were kind of discussing earlier about tailoring tightly to the role that you're applying for, taking out those key skills and obviously showing evidence. But I, I very much like that interest and achievement section about that sailing piece. Sometimes that's the the USP, hmm. uh, the unique yes. selling point of the application of the applicant um, to make them stand out because perhaps maybe everybody else in their class would have similar modules, academic projects, and uh, grades, for example, exactly. um, and the internships. Um, will help them stand out also and that in um, the interest in achievements, uh, giving also an opportunity to discuss at an interview something else um, and to give that, uh, I suppose, that rounded version of who the applicant is. Um, thanks very much. Um, I think another question came through. So I'm looking at two different types of questions here, one in Q&A, one in questions. Um, thank you very much uh, for all your questions. Um, for Laura, it's amazing to get into McKenzie and get accepted to Harvard Business School. Was there certain skills, experience, et cetera, that you believed helped uh, you get into these positions? You may have covered that already, Laura. Um, yeah, well, I, th I think very briefly, um, you know, clearly, I think these these organizations, they, they look for people who have academically done reasonably well, which I'm sure everyone on this call has done. And then what they're really doing is they're looking for. So what else do you bring in addition to your academics? 
Um, for me, a lot of the time that was sailing. So I had, you know, competed at a very high level of sport where I could then clearly show, um, you know, that that was like a little business nearly. You know, I had to fundraise in order to do competitions. I had to be very focused on my training. And then, you know, it was around teamwork and leadership. Um, and it really was around drive, determination, setting goals, achieving goals. So I would kind of tell a little bit of a narrative around why my sport was, you know, akin to uh, showing a lot of these leadership teamwork skills. And I think, you know, a lot of people, be it, you know, be it music, be it, um, you know, it could be drama, it could be other levels of sport, rugby, soccer, um, you know, uh, ga. I think it's about finding where you're passionate and what your niche is, and then really creating a bit of a narrative around that. Um, clearly, people want to work with people that they like and that they think, well, they'll have some level of shared interest in. And, you know, it might not be, you know, probably a lot of people don't sail, but they at least can relate to someone who's very passionate about a sport or about an extracurricular activity. So I think it's really important to highlight the things in addition to your leaving certificate, in addition to your university exams. What else are you bringing to, to the table that makes you a little bit more distinctive than some of the other, other people? And it is worth thinking about that in advance. You know, what skills? does that demonstrate that I have? I think passion is, is another very important thing. I think, you know, pe people want to people want to work with people who really like what they're doing. I think Leonard mentioned earlier, you know, the number of people he speaks to that say, well, I know I should have left that job earlier. I think um, I'm a big proponent in if you're not enjoying your job, change it. You know, I mean, we all have, luckily, we've got good 100%. educations, mm. you know, and, and I think that's what an, a good education enables you to do. When you have a good education, you it does enable you to switch roles if you're really not enjoying your role. Because if you're not enjoying what you're doing, you're not going to be the best at it. And you should put yourself in an environment. As I get older in my career, um, and I'm sure Leonard's the same, I really want, the most important thing is the people that I work with. I want to work with people who I really like, respect, trust. They don't have to be my best friends, but I need to respect them professionally and I need to respect all their values and I want to make sure that I'm putting myself in that environment because I know when I'm working with other people who share the same goals that I do and I have similar values with then I'm going to be able to perform at my best and at my team's best so I think I, I think about all those kind of different areas so I suppose you know it's uh, I, I, th I think lots of people have the ability you've got to be confident enough to, to go out and ask those questions you know um, you know, I, I didn't come from a family that anyone had ever gone done to consulting or, or gone to, to university in America or anything. Um, but but I knew that I would be supported if I tried to do those things. And uh, look, luckily, if you go and you kind of find out what are the scholarships that are available and um, talk to people, lots of people like myself are very happy to discuss, uh, you know, how they how they um, kind of came to where they did. You know, I know when I was applying to business school in America, I spoke to lots of alumni. I, even some some very very successful ones were really good and reviewed my applications the, one of the people who I actually I remember to this day I, I had to apply but I think it was the 1st of January. So I was, of course, late with my applications and stuff. So I'd only written them over Christmas. And I sent them to uh, one, of my, one, of, one of my quite senior bosses in the UK on the 26th of December. He came back to me with a whole page of comments and says, Laura, this is not going to work. You're talking to an American audience. You need to, you know, not be modest. You need to tell them why you're amazing, why these skills are good. And you, you need to focus like you're an American. American people always tell everybody how great they are. And that's what you need to do if you're applying to an American business school. So it was great advice. And I suppose I was, I was amazed that people would take that time, but 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 if you don't ask, you don't get. So a lot of people really are prepared to help younger people in order to explain the opportunities and help them to achieve them. Thanks very much, Laura. And I think it's it's I think it's important that within those applications as well, kind of demonstrating that ambition, demonstrating that drive, and I suppose understanding in that interest and achievement section that pulling out something that demonstrates those skills as well. Don't mm -hmm. just kind of mention information for information's sake. Um, I was also just on that, uh, I was at a meeting, um, I was at a webinar yesterday for leadership and somebody mentioned that, of course, we, we don't like to sell ourselves on, on our CVs and cover letters. Pretend that you're writing your CV and cover letter for your best friend, for your brother, for your sister, for somebody that you actually want to get this role rather than yourself. So it's actually, uh, you're writing it for somebody else and you'd be surprised um, how quickly that terminology and language begins to change and starts it to be a little bit more flattering 
when you're trying to sell somebody else. Mm. Um, so it's very interesting. Leonard, do you want I think, to say No, I was just going to say, I think that might be an Irish cultural thing. Because w- when you were speaking there, Laura, you know, the Americans won't leave you in any doubt. You know, you'll be crystal clear very quickly, you know, going to a restaurant in America. And if somebody's not happy, they'll be there like that at the waiter. <laughs> right. That's just the way they are. But we, we are naturally more modest, self-deprecating. So um, just, just to be aware of that, that's all. Um, I would say just, just a, a couple of other points just before I forget to say them. Um, when Laura spoke there about, you know, respecting the people you work with in a good work environment, I can't emphasize that enough. The vast majority of people out there are fantastic, but it, it happened to me once in my career where you end up working in an environment which is not which is not conducive and positive and get out of it, you know. Don't put up with it. Again, it's an Irish thing. I think we're very good at enduring. But, you know, looking back, uh, personally, I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but there was certainly one job I was in where I left that decision probably a couple of years longer than I should have done so again you know it's it's not a failure if if you don't fit you don't fit or you know if the other people aren't your style or whatever that's not a that's not a failing and uh, the failing is to not deal with it you know, and and uh, make the change go for it and then just the last comment just she's very modest clearly but I think only about a quarter of a percent of people that apply to McKinsey actually get the job so Clearly, you're in that uh, category. I have, I have a son who's doing use, doing commerce, and he's quoting these statistics to me around uh, McKinsey. So, I'm not sure will he make it, but we'll see. We'll see. I think he's smarter than me. So there we go. Well, I, th- I think for for me, the big thing is you know you go, you explore these opportunities, you talk to the alumni, you know, and and if you if you don't put yourself forward, you definitely don't get the role. And then if you put yourself exactly. forward, typically you learn a lot from each of the different interviews, you know, and then and then you begin to realise actually, and sometimes you really enjoy the interviews actually, and you say that's something I'd really like to do, <clears throat> and sometimes you do the interviews and you say, ooh really what my job's going to entail I'm not sure I actually want to do that or that's what I want to do so I think it's about exploration and and understanding and I think being really true with yourself I think a lot of people you know uh, will have pressures from from you know be it external sources or whatever to to do things that maybe someone else would like you to do I I I think I would encourage all the all the students here today you know you know try I know it's difficult but try and put those things aside and just say you know what would I really like to do what would make me happy I suppose as I say we're all going to work for I don't know 40, 40 or 50 years or something and I think it's, it's making sure that kind of you're doing something because you're really passionate about it luckily I think we're all going to be hopefully economically okay you know there's reams of okay but you know that shouldn't be the driver money you know it should really be about I'm going to be spending the majority of my waking hours at work every week you know for a long period of time and I want to spend those th- those hours doing something with people I enjoy and doing something that I, that I really enjoy and that I'm passionate about so I think you know follow, follow what you really want to do and that takes years right I'm still moving careers occasionally and it's you know that changes over time but I think finding those things that you're really passionate about will mean that you will be very successful in what you end up doing. Thanks Laura yeah I, I think it's kind of looking at the career planning piece focusing on the reflection uh, research planning and taking action I think a lot of I suppose, students start looking at the companies what companies should we apply to when when are those um, the deadlines open for applications but that but the reflection piece is probably the most important looking at those skills values um, what type of company would you like to work in the long run so very thank yeah, you very no, much for that thank that's, you that's really I, I can't emphasize that enough Fiona that's wise advice I mean I, I thought when I was 20 that my parents hadn't a clue but turns out you know now that I'm in the situation they, they did you know listen to that that's you know uh, I was just so grateful to get a job right it was different world we just took anything but you know as time went on you know what, what you're doing and what you're making so for me personally I started in it was a great company ICI in the UK but we were making perspex sheets very important right perspex and polymer composites and all that kind of stuff but ultimately the move into pharmaceutical for me was very positive in that you know you're not just making widgets or you're not just making perspex you're making something that's very often life life saving life saving treatment so it certainly gives you a little bit of feeling you're doing something good you're, you're you know you're you're providing something that's important to society look what we're learning in the last 12 months like you can imagine all those people working in those companies pfizer and moderna and all them making making those vaccines i mean that is that is going to transform everybody's life now. So it's, it's a big deal. Yeah. Absolutely. So the importance of working with a company that aligns with, with your own values is so important mm-hmm. and that self-reflection piece. Absolutely, Leonard. Thanks for that. And, um, it's, and it's okay to be motivated by money as well. You know, you have to pay the bills. You've got to have somewhere to live. You know, so don't be shy about that because, you know, I certainly remember starting off again that the, the, the environment I grew up in, you know, to, 
there was no money around anyway everyone was skint right and as a student i was certainly skint um you know but you, you need to make sure that you're, you're being looked after where you go to work you know in terms of what you're rewarded nothing wrong with that absolutely so financial reward um work-life balance a challenging environment so again it's spending that time kind of understanding what's important and what are your your top three priorities um Thanks very much. Um, there, a question come, came in in relation to, I suppose, personal branding. Um, obviously, when you send your CV and cover letter uh, within uh, for an application, um, would you, I suppose, look at, I suppose, LinkedIn? If, if there's an opportunity that and you saw somebody who you were perhaps maybe going to call them for interview, would you would LinkedIn be an important uh, platform? Do, do you, would you recommend students to be on a platform um, such as LinkedIn? And would you, mm. I suppose, look at that? in advance of an interview, for example. Yeah, you, um, go ahead, Laura. I've, I've talked a good bit there. Yeah, go ahead. So, 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 so I would certainly recommend that people do think about personal branding, I suppose. And I would think about, um, you know, YouTube videos, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, that sort of stuff. You know, these things are footprints that are going to be there forever. Um, so I, I, I would I, I would always just be cautious and make sure, you know, if my, you know, if my parents, if my aunt, if my uncle, if my grandmother or something saw, saw, saw this on, online, would I be OK with that? You know, um, a lot of employers uh, over the past couple of years and increasingly so will do quick checks um, either at the point of interview or certainly um, on a reference check prior to offering job applications. So I think it, I, I, I think I would just be cautious is the way I'll do it. You know, I've seen friends or people post stuff and I'm like not sure I would do that personally you know um I think some employers will look at LinkedIn um I think it's good to have a profile on it I suppose increasingly I think it's Im Im important um and and I, I would I, I would always certainly just yeah have that kind of sense check in there you know am I comfortable with this information being in the public domain if the answer is no then I'd just be careful about putting it up on the the public record because these things stay for forever these days I suppose um and and I I think you know we need to be aware that 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 now there is so many data sources you know <clears throat> i'm i'm sure whenever i've joined a new company i'm pretty sure they looked at all my social media you know and said what do we find out about laura dillon and that sort of stuff so i think firms will will, will check things so, so so i would just be aware of that thanks laura leonard do you have anything to add on to that i think that was great great advice laura yeah sorry i was on mute there um That's no okay. i think I, I couldn't add to that um Really, yeah. it's become the new way. I mean, LinkedIn is the new way. Um, per personally, I've yeah, when I've been changing jobs, you know, mostly it's ad either been advertised or in some cases, um, just making a per, you know a phone call to somebody I know, and that that is that is still that still goes on. Uh, we have a even in our own company in our PM group, you know, we we do have a uh, request to, to to employees, you know, to 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 connect with their friends, that kind of thing, to 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 bring in, you know. The right type of people so it's all about networks absolutely it's it's, it's a great networking platform but students i suppose mm. have to remember it's, it's a professional platform it's yes. not facebook it's not instagram yeah. um and yeah. it is professional network and it's a great networking tool but it also has a number of tools that can be used for for net for students mm. um you can do a number of um searches um for alumni and and again network and introduce yourself to 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 alumni and it's a it's a great platform, I suppose, to do that. And I think, Laura, as you mentioned about that digital footprint, it's important for students to look at their own digital footprint that they already have. Um, look at putting information private and not public. And you can all do that research yourself, just Google yourselves and see what actually comes up. So even from today, let, let that new step be put everything on, on private and just manage that digital footprint because employers can actually look, it's only a click away and employers, as you say, Leonard um, and Dora, they actually do sometimes as well. Um, a, a question actually came in, um, in relation to looking at uh, because of the current situation and the summer perhaps maybe of last year and perhaps maybe this year as well, that uh, they have not been able to go on internship due to current restrictions. Do you think that this will affect um, their application in comparison to applications that have had this opportunity, that have had that internship? Um, who would like to go first? Yeah, I, I, I don't think so overall. You know, it's 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 really, I think Laura talked about it very well earlier on, talking about in interviews, it's it's your personality and, um, you know, the things you've done be above and beyond your academic achievements. So you are where you are now because of your academic ability. 
Um, but as you as you move out of the college environment and into work, it's 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 that and everything else. Like I thought, my pinnacle of my achievements in my whole life when I left college was just getting through it, right? And it turns out, of course, looking back, that it's still only the start, and it's all the other stuff that you've done. So if you've missed an internship opportunity, you know, it's not the end of the world, you know. I think I, I think I would agree. I think everybody understands the current challenges that COVID bring and the restrictions that that brings. So I wouldn't I wouldn't be too stressed about that. You know, if there's an opportunity to even maybe do a short, you know, even two week work experience or something, that could be an alternative if that's viable. But I understand that at the moment, you know, with 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 COVID, um, I think just work experiences, uh, internships, they're they're not the same, and 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 people people don't want to, you know, even myself, I don't want to take on people um to give them a uh, a suboptimal experience because you know when everyone's working remotely it's a lot more challenging and I think employers understand that at the moment so I would kind of focus on the the, the other areas I suppose as well. Thanks very much. Um, I suppose it is it's a very challenging time for, for, all, for our students at the moment but I suppose looking at those opportunities perhaps in the future and maybe some volunteering experiences perhaps maybe some shadowing experience or kind of a short-term work, work experience. Um, thank you both. Another question came in here and um, thank you very much students for um, sending them in. What do both speakers see as the biggest opportunities or the most important sectors or areas in the next decade? That's a very interesting question. Thanks Con. Um, Laura, would you like to maybe go first? Yeah. Um, what would I say? I would, if I was a student, I would be focused on where do I think a lot of growth is going to come out of the the, the next decade, you know. And I think uh, one thing I've learned through my career, it's always easier to be successful in an industry that's growing, I suppose. You know, if there's some level of growth in the industry, then kind of a, a rising tide makes everybody lift, I suppose, you know. Uh, you can be very successful in downward trending stuff, but it's a little bit more difficult typically you know I think there's clearly a lot of opportunities um uh in in far in pharmaceuticals um and also in med tech in Ireland we are currently looking at a number of service companies into data centers that are exploding throughout Europe I suppose um so I think that definitely creates opportunities but what I would also think about kind of strategically what's going to be good industries for me to learn about what am I interested in learning about where do I geographically want to be located? So for example, if I definitely want to be in Ireland longer term, I would think about wh where does Ireland have to have those niches? And that I suppose is around the pharma, the med tech, um, some of the data centers, some of the engineering type companies. Um, so, 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 I, so I would look at growth sectors, but I'd also then think about, you know, how does that fit with my own goals of, of, of potentially staying in Ireland or not? And, and what really what, what really excites me, you know, am I excited about the kind of chemical end of it? Am I excited more about the, the nuts and bolts engineering side of it? Am I excited about more the computer coding side of it? Um, you know, clearly there are huge opportunities um, for nearly everyone in computer science and coding and, you know, a lot of the technology businesses, both here in Ireland, but, but you know, I suppose throughout Europe and, and in the US. Um, so so, so I, would, I would kind of really come back to, you know, what, where, what am I excited about and then see if I can find an opportunity in a, in a sector that that really excites me thanks very much laura um leonard yep yeah, uh, i got sorry i had to go i had to go off there there was someone at the door so that's okay <laughs> that's why i went on so i just stopped the video the postman delivering another delivery leonard another yeah yeah, delivery. yeah exactly another uh, another amazon package coming in um yeah I, I i'd be pretty much aligned with what laura said you know if, if you want to live in ireland think about the things that are successful here um, you know, pharma, I'm a bit biased there, having spent most of my career in that sector, medical medical devices, you know, enhancing human health, that's been very much proven in the last 12 months, you know. Um, technology, clearly, you know, it's it's still, you know, I remember in the mid 90s, they, they were talking about, you know, uh, technology will, will, will continue to grow at double digits and I said that could never could, can never last of course how wrong I was you know it's it's still accelerating now so if you're interested in technology and the applications of it de definitely uh yeah I'm not sure what else to say yeah do do what do what uh, excites you because it'll get you out of bed in the morning <laughs>